Bueno, buenas tardes a todos. Gracias por acompañarnos hoy en esta tarde de miércoles. Sé que todos han tenido días largos de trabajo, así que agradecemos que se conecten para acompañarnos. Creo que tenemos una presentación muy interesante hoy. Eh, bueno, primero mi nombre es Jocely Miners y les quiero dar la bienvenida de parte mía y de mi colega Flavia Belpoliti, que juntas somos directoras de TEX, the Texas Coalition for Heritage Spanish, aquí en eh, Texas, y somos parte de CORAL, the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning. Sabemos que muchos de ustedes eh, se unen a nuestros Hangouts Webinars todo el tiempo, así que agradecemos que estén aquí de vuelta, y los que son nuevos, que están aquí por primera vez, eh, les queremos dar la bienvenida, y esperamos que eh, aprendan mucho hoy, y que sigan viniendo a nuestros eventos. Hoy tenemos eh, un webinar de la doctora Emily Bernate y les quiero contar que más adelante este semestre esperamos tener otro webinar muy interesante y también quiero anunciar porque estamos muy emocionados porque ya tenemos las fechas y el tema de nuestro workshop de verano que es un taller de dos días, el primero y el dos de junio y será por primera vez en la historia en UT San Antonio. Entonces, algunos de ustedes han venido varias veces a los workshops aquí en Austin, pero esta vez nuestros colegas de UTSA eh, van a ser los anfitriones, así que eh, por favor, save the date y luego podemos enviarles más información. Entonces, ya que tenemos eh, eh, los anuncios, vamos a empezar para lo que vinimos hoy. Creo que estamos muy emocionados de escuchar a la doctora Emily Bernate y bueno Emily voy a, voy a hacer un poco de Spanglish Emily is assistant professor of Spanish in the Department of Languages, Literatures and Cultures at St. Edwards University aquí en Austin, Texas Her research interests include sociolinguistics and pragmatics particularly gender differences in language and politeness norms She has taught second language and heritage language courses in Spanish at the University of Houston where she completed her MA and PhD coursework Currently, she teaches courses in Spanish linguistics with a focus on Spanish heritage learners and Spanish in the United States. And clearly, she has very interesting and fun strategies for teaching. <laughs> This is not the first time she presents with us. So we are very grateful, Emily, that you're here again. Y hoy su presentación se llama La Combi Completa, Encouraging Grammar, Dialect, and Cultural Competence Through Reggaeton. Así que bienvenida, Emily, y ya tienes la palabra. Thank you. Um, I'll stop my job of admitting people and then I'll have you do that as people continue to come in. Welcome. I see that we have middle, high school and college. I see that we have California, Nueva York, Ohio, North Carolina, Texas, España. Estamos en todas partes. So that's nice to see. Um, I'll tell you that when I started this um, presentation, I wanted to show you guys how I mostly use reggaeton to teach language variation, but I thought again, and I thought, well, not everybody's curriculum will allow them to focus on language variation in the classroom. So hopefully I have come up with what that Yankee, our godfather of reggaeton might tell us is the la combi completa. It has everything in it. Um, you can use reggaeton in the classroom to teach anything from dialect variation to second language versus first language pronunciation to culture to grammar vocabulary etc so hopefully one of those topics will resonate for, with you um if you haven't yet as people have been coming in i've asked them to put where they teach and what level they teach um Hopefully I have a little bit of something for everybody, um, but it helps me know what slides to focus on if I see what levels you are most comfortable or most um, frequently working with in the classroom. Um, so here's what we're gonna do today. Um, first we'll start, this is not a history class, but first we'll start with a little bit of una breve historia de la, del reggaeton, de la música latina en general, la música urbana, 
just because I think sometimes when we look at pop culture topics, um, some people are reluctant to incorporate them into academic dialogue and work them in the, into the classroom environment because they feel like if it's pop culture, um, it's 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 less than. <laughs> so um, I think if I give a little bit of history, we can appreciate the, um, the multiple roots and transnational qualities that reggaeton has so that we're less willing to dismiss it as something not worth academic dialogue. Uh, then I'll explain a little bit why I find reggaeton to be very um, motivating in terms of creating inclusivity in the classroom, including different languages, dialects, voices, um, accents, etc. Then I'll show you some uh, snippets, some small screenshots of sample lessons. Um, then we'll discuss how to respond to the skeptics um, that might have some kind of implicit bias towards reggaeton. And then I'll give you time to chat and work in groups together. Uh, so that's what we'll be doing for the next maybe 40 minutes or so, 45. Uh, first, a bit of history. When I ask my students, bueno, de donde, de donde viene el reggaeton? Most of them tell me Puerto Rico. And I say, yes, but, but before, before that, there was a lot of things going on in the Caribbean world that led us to this genre that we have today. Um, so anybody want to guess my, my first question? Uh, when, when the US started building the Panama Canal, um, we see that rather than high, simply hire Panamanian workers from around the canal zone, they preferred to hire Jamaican workers instead and brought them from Jamaica to the US controlled canal zone Anybody want to take a guess? You can, guesses are free in the chat today. Why Jamaican workers? They were English speakers, yeah. They said there was there were some economic reasons as well, but mostly you got it, Beth. They were English speakers and they thought it's better for us to just bring over English speakers that can understand us rather than having our people learn another language. Uh, eventually, those Jamaican workers um, stayed around uh, and incorporated into Panamanian society. Um, but when we think of Jamaica, what kind of music do we think of? Before reggaeton, maybe no one wants to spell it. Yeah, you do want to spell it. We can spell it. Yeah, great. So we see that Jamaican workers incorporating into Panamanian society, I'll admit you, um, brought with them reggae music, but they were in this hectic um, urban society. And we, there were a lot of changes in instrumentation, experimenting with dance hall music. Uh, people started to develop these new freedoms to go out, clubs, and this dance hall beat, which is kind of that kind of beat that you hear now in reggaeton, uh, basically um, was passed through cassette tapes throughout Panamanian society, but by people who were more familiar with reggae music. That's how we start to get reggaeton. Um, but it doesn't just stay in Panama. We see that a lot of Panamanians then move to the northeast of the US, uh, mostly in New York and surrounding areas. And a lot of Caribbean populations lived together, um, hung out together, and experimented musically together, taking these dance hall beats and experimenting with them and changing the languages. So we see Puerto Ricans and Panamanians, also a lot of people from Trinidad, together creating this music for these underground clubs. And then it doesn't just stay in New York either. Um, we also know that Puerto Ricans, um, for a variety of factors, were quite mobile between the continental US and the island, and they bring that music back and forth. So reggaeton really starts to take off in Puerto Rico. Um, unfortunately, it um, gets associated with a culture of drugs and violence. Um, so we know it's not going to stay there. If it had just stayed 
with those negative associations of drug culture and violence, uh, it probably would not have taken such an international turn. But we see soon after that, the Latin music industry begins to invest lots of time and money and resources in Miami. And we know that other Latin populations were living in Miami at the time. I think we can thank the Estefan family for lots of uh, investment in the Latin music scene in Miami, but whatever the consequence, whatever um, the reason was, um, that becomes a place where um, lots of Colombian artists are then hired by these recording studios in Miami. And uh, they take reggaeton to another place, um, more of a radio ready pop culture scene. And finally, I would say that today we're in a very transnational age with reggaeton. I can think of lots of collaborations with English singers, but it doesn't just end there. Um, this summer I was in Turkey and heard Turkish reggaeton with, with um, pieces of German in it. Yeah, German and Turkish reggaeton. So um, if you weren't convinced that it is a phenomenon that is going to be here for a while, that your students are going to be enjoying for a while, hopefully this gives you a little bit of history as to the richness of where it's come from. I will put a disclaimer and say that I made things sound a bit more linear, where the history is obviously more complicated than that. But let's get on to the language part. Um, I think one reason why I really enjoy bringing reggaeton to the classroom is that I want to be able to validate a variety of voices and I want students to have experience with dialects that they don't always hear um, in their community. Since I'm in Texas and many of my students are from Texas, most of them are very familiar with Mexican and Central American dialects, but not so much Caribbean dialects. And they tell me, oh, I don't understand when Puerto Ricans talk. I don't understand what they're saying. So I want to give them experience with other dialects. Also, because we just saw that reggaeton is in a very transnational age where it is common to see collaborations with people from different dialects or even speakers of different languages. It's also really helpful for the second language learners to hear different people singing the same words coming from different accents or even different first languages. Um, and it's something familiar. There's always a bridge and then there's a hook. <laughs> and that hook means there's always something for students to latch onto and memorize um, as kind of a base word or a base conjugation or a base phrase that can help them memorize a grammar topic that we're working on. So before I give you some sample lessons, um, I'll just give you some snippets from some sample lessons. Uh, maybe take a moment to think about what you might teach in your classroom using reggaeton. Maybe you love the music, maybe you hate it. Either is fine, but your students probably love it. Anyone want to type anything? Oh, my chat is quiet today. I like the direct and indirect objects. In fact, one of the songs that I'll show you today, I won't show you direct and indirect objects, but it's a song that I use for direct and indirect object. Oh yeah, that L and R sound. <laughs> yes, I have a lesson on that that I use once again. It works for things. Los distintos acentos, también. The final S dropping, también. Vocabulario en general, también. Mm, sí, es la combi completa. So let's look at some things. Ah, questions and answers. Hey, it does kind of have that call and response to it. That's it. That's an interesting one. I haven't thought about. La vida rural. Yeah, and lots, and lots of vocabulary associated with that. So those are some great answers. Well, here's something that probably everybody has taught. Um, if you are a teacher or are going to be a teacher, I love that they must como gentrificación, by the way. I'm going to start what I'm doing to talk about that too. That's that's a wonderful one. Um, when we talk about prestige and 
like the overt prestige versus covert prestige, like formal and informal dialects. Um, my students love to analyze how Bad Bunny has capitalized on covert prestige. So yeah, we can even use them for the hard linguistic topics as well. But okay, so here we've got one present tense verbs. Um, if you're not a teacher, um, but you will become one one day, you will likely be charged with teaching some version of present tense verbs in your life. If not, um, at least you are a user of present tense verbs. I think I got everybody in there. Um, my heritage learners are really great at using present tense verbs. Um, they're great at knowing what they mean, uh, but what's hard for them is categorizing them and explaining how they're categorized in the structure and using linguistic terminology to describe what's going on with these verbs. So we study the patterns of regular and irregular verbs, and then we add spelling changes and we add stem changes. And if it's a really good group, we add accent changes, although sometimes that's not worth the time. But we study all kinds of present tense verbs, but then I have to have students be able to describe a verb and what characteristics it has and how they know that. So I think reggaeton is a great opportunity. I gave you a song that I like. I use this one in class um, a lot. You'll also see that it has some great direct and indirect object pronouns and words that would represent direct and indirect objects and sentences in a variety of orders. But um, it's a song that I use for that, but I also use it to talk about present tense verbs. I gave you just a part of the sheet that I give them. And I'll say, I don't give students the whole song at once because it's overwhelming, mucha letra. But I give them about a column worth of text. I think I screenshotted one of my activities and cut it in half. Um, so yeah, and you don't have to give them the entire song at once. Pick out a part that has the feature that you're working on. Um, so I give them this and we listen to it and we talk about it and everybody feels great about talking in class because everybody has an opinion. Who does it better? Is it Maguma or Carol G? And so we're already talking. We listen to the song. We got to watch the video and then students categorize the verbs. And this is the fun part of class. When I walk around and I see them working in groups and I hear conversations like, Oh, but merezco, that's, that's cambio ortográfico because it's merecer, but there's no Z in the original word. And when they start justifying and explaining words, I see that, wow, they're really gaining experience at understanding the construction of ver the verb conjugations in present tense. So I'm going to give you some options. Um, those of you that teach college will probably just put the original video up on the screen and whatever images are there, they're totally fine. Um, those of you that teach middle school, I had a few, um, you might want to put an acoustic version of the song, but if you're not comfortable using um, a video in class, uh, just because of the visual content, I would say that there's almost always an acoustic version of these songs or a live version of these songs that you could view. And the side benefit of having an acoustic version is that usually the lyrics go by a bit slower, okay? Reggaeton we find is usually on a 90 beat, 90 beats per minute, um, but the acoustic versions, people often can't keep that up for that long. So the acoustic versions end up going by a little bit slower. So that's one thing. Um, okay, another topic that I have looked at in class with students, particularly when I have more heritage learners than second language learners, is where to put an accent on words. And we kind of divide it into our one syllable words, when they need an accent, when they don't, and then our verbs um, that need an accent in the preterite conjugations, the AR verbs, um, either in the yo form or the ele jousted form. And they can repeat the rule back, but it is hard for them to hook onto that difference. They, many of them have only experienced these words orally, so they don't have a visual image of whether or not the word has an accent or not. 
how would they ever know if most of their input is oral? So usually I do a song by Osuna that I find very fun because I think the students find it funny that I like Osuna so much. Um, but this semester in the translation class, um, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to introduce Shakira's um, this song to PK. It was it was quite a fun moment when it came out, and there were lots of opportunities to study accents on monosyllabic words and with preterite verb morphology. So I thought, well, Osuna can can be set aside for now, and we will listen to Shakira's. Um, it also created the opportunity to have a great discussion about ethics and as an artist what are you allowed to reveal about your personal life or somebody else's personal life to the public um, in a rather mm, permanent way because this song will be forever on YouTube as um, not presenting somebody else in a positive light. Okay. But the students go through and they decide and they justify and they say, well, por mi todo bien, which me is this? Is it the one with or without an accent? Oh, well, it doesn't mean mine, it actually means me. Necesita un acento. So you get to have the opportunity to hear them make justifications and talk about the language and get some of that metalinguistic vocabulary. Um, now for one of the topics that somebody mentioned, uh, my students tend to have this general idea that S is not always pronounced the same by everybody, but they're not really sure what it's doing. And uh, there's some multiple things that can happen when they're not aware of the possibilities of what can happen with an S. Uh, sometimes I'll have students say, oh, pero mi mamá me dijo que el español mexicano es mejor que el español puertorriqueño. Porque nosotros pronunciamos todas las letras. And then I usually say something kind of sarcastic. Like, well, what does she think about English, right? With all of our uh, unpronounceable letters. Hmm, wonder what she'd say about French. So it's sometimes we get to talk about um, cultural um, associations, uh, value judgments uh, placed on different accents. Um, but sometimes for the second language learners, it's that they truly don't understand the words being said when the S's are not very sibilant, strong S pronunciations as we see in English. So we talk about different dialects, um, why we think for some reason that S aspiration, when I say aspira S aspiration, I mean not pronouncing a strong sibilant S. Um, when, when we get to talk about that, I get to present a lot on racial prejudice and why racial prejudice usually leads to linguistic prejudice, where students can end up with these ideas like, well, where did you hear that Puerto Rican Spanish is bad Spanish? Oh, because they don't pronounce the S. Hmm, what about all of our silent letters in English? Hmm, but why are we not mad at English for doing that, but we're mad at Puerto Rican Spanish or something? And we've got lots of songs that can show that. Um, in the interest of time, I won't really play them for you, um, but I'm happy to go back in the chat and put a list of them or copy all of my links so that you can enjoy them on YouTube later. Uh, one thing I love about Reyeton is their obsession with collaboration right now. They have lots of opportunities for us to hear how speakers of different dialects of Spanish approach the pronunciation of the same word. Because usually both people in the song get to sing the bridge and the chorus at least once. And so you get to hear how two different people approach it. So I, again, I didn't copy the whole activity, but I gave you a piece of what I give them. On the screen, I usually show the voices, the two different voices or the two different singers uh, in different colors. And I usually give them a copy where like one is in regular text and one is in italics or something. And they okay, I'm not sure. okay, I don't want to read in there. Um, I usually put the lyrics on the screen and we have the students look at it and we say, okay, well, we what do we learn about S's? Where might an S not sound like a sibilant, strong English-like S? Where might it be aspirated? And they learn that at the end of a syllable, 
exasperation is almost always possible. And they go and mark them all as, okay, now you've got your guide, let's listen for it. And we go back and we listen to the two different singers. And one of them aspirates lots of S's. If you know where Osuna and Panina are from, you can probably guess who aspirates lots of S's and who has a very strong sibilant S. And we go through and analyze, well, why is their speech different? We look at the reasons why that variation exists. And as somebody mentioned, I also use this one to talk about what happens to those R's that end up sounding like L's and who does that and why we are so averse to it and tend to evaluate that kind of pronunciation negatively in society. And the answer is almost always racism and classism leads to linguistic discrimination. And so it's a great window to talk about um, the negative aspects of variation and the variations in language that are stigmatized for racial and class reasons. Um, and here's one that I use uh, that I think helps out my English speakers, uh, my native English speakers, the L2 learners, maybe a bit more than the heritage learners, but I'll show you why I think it's also a great topic for heritage learners and ends up benefiting them as well. Um, I like to look at how English and Spanish are slightly different in pronunciation or in structure or in pragmatics. I think it's fun for bilingual students to tap into how their the languages they speak are similar and how they're slightly different. Um, and so we look at the pronunciation of in English and Spanish. Um, if you're, most of you look like you're at home, so you can probably do this out loud without feeling too weird. Um, you're all muted, I think, so just say it. Um, maybe look at these two words, pi and pie, and try to see if you can feel a different P in pi and pie, pi, pie. If you can't hear a difference, put your hands here. I feel like people aren't really, oh, okay, thanks. Some of you are doing, thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> the weirdness. And say, pi, pie, pi, pie, pi, pie. Can you feel a difference? Like, where do you feel more air? Pi, yeah, yeah. You feel more air in the English version. Well, we have a different P option. We have two options for P in English, yeah. Then do the same thing with T, they, T, they. T, the, you can feel the difference, right? English, when we have these P, T, K, K, T, K at the beginning of our words, they end up coming out with an additional aspiration of air. And that option just isn't available in Spanish. And then I like to show after we've seen, hmm, English has these two options. Spanish has only has this one. Then what happens when English speakers end up approaching pronunciation of Spanish words? Uh, I did this one recently because I was thinking about the Super Bowl and I was like, ah, didn't the weekend sing at the Super Bowl a while back, a couple of years ago? And so we we really just looked at the phrase in this song, maybe you know it, puede que no te haga falta nada. And we said it and we listened to it and we put our hand here and we felt it. And we go through and we hear how Maluma sings it and we hear how The Weeknd sings it. La vocal influye? No, it's that when it's the initial sound. So if you say pot and then you say spot, I, I had a question in the chat. If you say pot and then you say spot, that second one is not going to have as much aspiration on the p sound okay so it has to do with just being the initial sound in a word or the initial sound that you speak when you first start an utterance um but in spanish we don't have that rule about how we aspirate and add an additional little puff of air to our consonants at the beginning so when we listen to the weekend students immediately say oh well he sounds like an english speaker so yeah, he does sound like an English speaker because he's an English speaker, right? That's where most of his linguistic input came from. Y es normal que lo pronuncia así because that's how he's heard it his whole life, right? So it gives us a great opportunity to talk about non-standard production, production outside of the norm, and why we speak the way we all speak. I think a lot of times heritage learners have a funny 
sense of their pronunciation and feel like they have bad pronunciation when they're really quite accurate, but they have internalized that it's not 100% native-like, but just getting into the conversation of, well, if you hear somebody saying huebe instead of huele, if you hear a lot of that air come out on the huele, well, how are you going to respond? Is it something to like laugh about? Is it something to giggle about and say, oh, well, that sounds really silly. No, it's something to analyze. It's an opportunity to say, wow, I wonder what characteristics are present in his first language that motivated this kind of pronunciation. And I think in the end, that really actually helps heritage learners kind of ease this fear that they somehow know that their pronunciation is slightly different or some element of their language production is slightly different from that of a monolingual speaker who grew up in a Spanish-speaking country and didn't have any input from other languages. And so it gives them a chance to recognize that, yeah, we're kind of all linguistically we're products of our linguistic input. And that makes us sound a certain way. And it's just a fact of life. I think it kind of lowers the stigma of whatever they perceive to be their own non-standard production. So I gave you a few lessons, tried to give a snippet of something that would work in a beginning class, in an immediate class, in an advanced class. Um, but now, before you guys start thinking about how you might want to use reggaeton, I wanted to, I, every time I tell people how much I use reggaeton in class and how interested I am in sharing thing, fun things about pop culture while we look at language structures, um, I get a lot of, you mean you teach with that young kind of stuff, like mm, gross, like that's really what you do? You're quite, you know, you teach quite advanced students. You're just doing, the, the lyrics are terrible. People also say, oh, pero es tan vulgar. I get lots of those kind of comments. And so I wanted to share some things that I often share uh, to my teacher friends who tend to think that reggaeton is not worth an academic space. Uh, one is addressing the vulgarity. I hear a lot of reggaeton, everything's all about sex. And I say, well, you know, what is considered private versus what is considered public, especially in terms of bodies and desire, is not the same in every culture. Okay. Um, what can what you might approach in US culture as being a very taboo private topic that you don't say in public space might not have the same effect in another culture in another location. Um, also, even within a given culture, we all see that minoritized groups tend to push the boundaries of what is acceptable and what is unacceptable, unacceptable in society as a way of exercising agency and saying, we don't conform to your social rules because your social rules have ignored us and invalidated our voices. So you often see people trying to push the limits within minoritized groups. It's to be expected. Um, I would also sometimes tell them, yeah, but I hear reggaeton everywhere I go. I, I go, I, the other day in Austin here on a very English speaking radio station, I heard Titi me preguntó, and I was like, oh, okay, it's everywhere. If it's if it's on 93.3, which is a um, pop music station in Austin, um, it's now everywhere. And I would also remind people, um, this this one has, has put some people in shock before. Um, music of minoritized groups is almost always initially dismissed as something of little value. Um, students of music could take an entire semester on jazz. Jazz was not viewed favorably when it first started. They said it was cacophonous and ugly and too many sounds at the same time. Salsa music, because a lot of reggaetoneros um, listen to salsa, but it doesn't seem to happen the other way. Lots of salseros do not like reggaeton. They would view it as something that is less than. 
But salsa music was also very discriminated against when it was when it began. People said, why are you messing up our boleros and our mambo with all these timbales? Que desorden, it sounds terrible. So the fact that we are in a music genre that is changing and that features minoritized voices means we're going to have, encounter some kind of bias towards it. But I think that always it, in the end benefits the students to be able to have those conversations in the classroom. So hopefully you've seen a little bit about how I use reggaeton. You've also seen how I respond to the skeptics um, with a bit of either social or cultural theory. Um, so now I'd like to give you guys um, some time to work in breakout groups. I'll show you what your goal is. And then, of course, I want you to meet the people in your group and have some time to share with them and just get to know them. Um, then I would like for you to think about, based on your students and the level that you have, uh, what are some topics that you could teach using reggaeton? Um, I gave you some ideas, some starter points. Uh, students seem to be you now very interested in my class. I'm not sure why, with how we pronounce the 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 yo or jo or sho or however you say it. Students seem to be very interested in that. Um, and there's many different speakers now, um, many different dialects. Another thing that um, I recently did was when we use and don't use the subject and why. Um, so songs work really well for that. Or maybe you're not really into teaching grammar or even vocabulary right now and you want to focus on a cultural topic. Somebody mentioned in the chat at the beginning, looking at gender differences in reggaeton is also interesting. Okay, so why don't you guys discuss a topic that you have in mind? And if you have a song in mind, uh, think about how you might present that song to your students and how using some element of pop culture might motivate them to um, learn with a bit more enthusiasm than as if they just had a story from the textbook that they were analyzing. Um, right, it looks like you have your groups now. Um, I would say plan for about, uh, 15 minutes of sharing, 10 to 15, and then we'll bring you back. Okay, I think they're all back now. That was some of you, um, some of you enjoyed hasta el último segundo de los breakout rooms. That's nice. Um, so I don't know, Jocely, if you would like them to share with their mics on or just simply some phrases in the chat. Um, it's up to you, whatever you want to do. Yeah, there's not too many of you anymore. The break rooms kind of <laughs> whittled it down. So you're welcome to share with your mic on if you have a question or if you'd like to report back um, what your group decided would be a great way to use reggaeton in your classrooms. Well, one thing my group we talked about not being familiar with enough songs yet and wondering if there's a way that we can create uh, some sort of catalog of songs and what specific grammar points they could uh, help us teach. Um, or that, you know, I need to do, go do just type in reggaeton and start doing some research. <laughs> well, but I use I music, no but idea. I mean, I haven't, yeah, I need to update myself uh, ante los estudiantes, no? <laughs> Yeah, well, one thing I would say is like, um, sometimes I ask them, who are your favorite singers right now? Um, it, it's, it, it helps that I, I don't have very refined musical tastes and probably the music that they listen to is exactly the music I listen to. But um, so I often ask them, well, what do you like to listen to? And it, yeah, I pretty much get Bad Bunny every time and uh -huh. so I know why not Bad Bunny it is you know we're gonna listen to Bad Bunny okay so uh, I was like oh there's a lot of we got it okay there's plenty of things we can do with that um so I would say ask your students um I will also say 
it's going to take me a while, <laughs> but I have signed a book contract um, that is a textbook in Spanish, just using reggaeton nice. as input. Um, and, you know, you could use it as a supplementary text. Um, my one condition is that it's available online for very cheap. Um, so that will be coming out um, by the end of 2023 or the beginning of 2024. So there's that. Um, and uh, maybe I I'm happy to share all of these activities in like a Google Drive folder later via email. Um to give you guys an idea of, or to have these particular lessons. Um, and then if somebody else, if there's another fellow reggaetonero in the group, uh, I'll adjust the settings so that anybody can add to it. What about that? Perfecto. Muy bien. Other questions or ideas that you guys came up with in your groups? I think I would use um, we on my group, many of the teachers um, teach her heritage Spanish um, and we all live in an area where there are Spanish speakers, but um, some of the, the reggaeton songs like Después de la Playa on Bad Bunny, like there's so much authentic Puerto Rican Spanish in those songs. It, it, it you can the syntax and you know the rl and it's just that's a really good resource i think for people who live in maybe more rural areas to expose their students to what that type of spanish sounds like um so i think that maybe would be a good idea you have me dancing in my seat in my head right now that's a great song <laughs> there you go. yeah and i think it's a great opportunity to teach them about language uh variation and the students who came with that idea that mi mamá me dijo que el español mexicano es mejor porque nosotros pronunciamos todas las letras como son you, to have to be able to engage in dialogue with them about well hmm well what about the letter on the page makes that un mejor español and it's a great opportunity to talk about how racial prejudices then become linguistic prejudice as well uh, so I love the R and L topic. It also helps my L two speakers um, manage their comprehension a little bit better. We know that L two speakers tend to have a lower threshold for ambiguity, so when they hear fewer letters that they recognize as the ones on the page, um, when they know that what the possibilities of how these letters can actually sound like it when real people use them. It also helps their comprehension improve some confidence as well. Uh, so I like that song. <laughs> That's a great one. Anything else that you guys came up with that could be incorporated in your classes or a question? I, I have a question about code switching because some of the songs will use English. Um, and I'm wondering if there's a pattern like, is it is it for emphasis? Are they like, what is the pragmatic purpose between um, splicing it up with some English. I think a lot of times it's for emphasis and for humor. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times this, what comes to mind right now, like I, many of these people actually grew up in Miami. And I think about Pitbull and how he sings, he likes to mix both languages, but I think he's just expressing his bilingual reality. Um, I'd be really stuck in if I had only used one at a time. I'd, I'd be really stuck if you said, Emily, you get to speak Spanish for an hour y no quiero saber que tú también sabes inglés. If they told me that and I just had to stick with one, dang, that would be, that would be a real, really stifling <laughs> for me to pretend that I don't know English when clearly I do. Um, so I think a lot of times it's for emphasis and humor, but a lot of times it's just for fun. Um, it's actually also a great way to bring up bilingual identities, use a song that has code switching in class and have students talk about what effect does it have for you? How do you feel when you see both of those languages at once? Um, does it mean that Pitbull no longer knows Spanish because he uses some English? Now is it crappy Spanish because it has English in it? What do we do with that? So I, it's also a fun topic for discussing. Um, if your students aren't very talkative, I bet they have an opinion about that that they'd mm -hmm. want to share. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I, I love Spanglish in the classroom, by the way. I'm very Spanglish. But yeah, I can't just stick to Spanish because I know a lot of English. <laughs> um, and I think it's the same way for a lot of those singers who grew up in New York or Miami that sing in both languages. Um, you don't always have to use reggaeton either. There's a great song, Siete Dias, by Romeo Santos that also has a lot of English and Spanish, and it has a nice effect. Mm -hmm. um, anything else before I show you your, your final slide? Uh, no, I just have a, a comment that we made in the group. Um, some of us who are not that familiar with regatoni, <laughs> maybe my age, I don't know, but um, uh, we are familiar with other gender. So we can apply that, right, to other types of music, right? These little strategies, right? Absolutely. Um, Thank I, you. I don't just use reggaeton in class. I would say I use a lot of it because it puts me in a good mood. And I suspect that some of my students know it. And um, it kind of lowers the stigma for doing a hard topic. Like, eh, mm -hmm. but we're going to do después de la playa. So who's, who's not going to be happy? Uh -huh. But but yes, I, I do like to apply this to other genres of music as well and show them some some great like 80s Spanish rock. That's always fun too. They get to laugh at the hairstyles. I get to promise that they used to be cool and you know, mm -hmm. that lightens them too. So yeah, you, it doesn't have to be reggaeton. Um, I just know that the students are familiar with it. All right, well, Joseli, do you wanna close this out? Yes, thank you so much, Emily. It's six o'clock, so your timing is beautiful. And I know that we all came here because we like to have fresh new ideas and I'm sure that we all got some new ideas and uh, this was amazing. So thank you so much, Emily, for sharing all your ideas with us. And like we said, we always share the video of the recording of the webinar along with the PowerPoint. And Emily has been kind enough to say she's gonna share some activities with us as well. We always send those out in our monthly newsletter. So make sure you're subscribed. And also I think we can send it to all the people who were registered today for the webinar. We do have a survey that we would love for you to fill out that helps us come up with new topics and see what worked and what didn't work. So please take a minute to fill it out, especially if you have ideas for topics for the future. Like I said, we probably will have one more webinar this spring semester, and then mark your calendars for our workshop that will be in-person two-day workshop in UT, at UT San Antonio, June 1st and 2nd. Y lo más importante ahorita que les quiero decir también es que para este workshop estamos buscando una, eh, una persona que sea maestro de high school o community college que pueda venir a presentar algún tema eh, del que, que estén trabajando de enseñanza de español como, segun, como lengua de herencia. Entonces tenemos un call for presenters abierto por si a alguno le interesa eh, venir a San Antonio. Teachers who, we were gonna pick one, one presenter or a pair of presenters if you wanna present in a team and we are able to cover your travel costs if you get selected to present. También tenemos un call for poster presentations where anyone who's working on um, anything related to heritage Spanish teaching, whether it be research or teaching or service, et cetera. If you want to present a poster at our workshop, you will receive free registration. So uh, Marco is going to be sharing the links uh, here for the calls. And also we will have everything sent via email. So thank you so much everyone for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Gracias, mil gracias de nuevo Emily por compartir su tiempo y todo lo que aprendimos hoy. Y esperamos verlos en nuestro próximo evento. Gracias a todos.